This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 506, recorded on August 10th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. You are a steady customer. Hey. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's, uh, I can't get enough. The, the warmth <laughs> continues, doesn't it? Oh, it's oppressive. Yeah, but the humidity is down, fortunately. 32 degrees Celsius. Yeah. 31. Just went down. <laughs> and at least no rain is in the forecast. No. It hasn't rained for a few days. Yeah. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's actually almost pleasant here. <laughs> almost. <laughs> it's, it's no longer pleasant. tropical? <laughs> yeah, it's it's 83 Fahrenheit, 28 C. The dew point is 63 Fahrenheit, 17 C. So it's uh, humidity came down. It's partly cloudy. Got some uh, decent amount of sun peeking through. And yep. it's kind of nice. Yeah. Look, don't complain because in a few months there'll be snow on the ground. <laughs> oh, there sure will be. And then you'll be complaining about that. Yep. I guess, you know, we just are not satisfiable when it comes to the weather. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everyone. Maybe. Hey, um, it's a little yeah. bit cooler here. It's only 30 degrees Celsius here. Ah, well. Uh, <laughs> we live in a heat bubble in New York City. Yes. Uh <laughs> And very sunny right now. I think it's going to rain all weekend. Is that right? Yes. Too bad. That's in the forecast here, too. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's good for the fish and the plants, right? Yeah, but not the fisher sure. people. Not I was, the fisher I was people. supposed to go tomorrow. Really? Oh, nuts. You better keep your eye on the oh, weather. Oh, darn. Sorry, Dixon. That's all right. I hate to disappoint you. We'll find other things to do. You'll just have to fly out to Montana or something. And Wouldn't that there. be nice? You, <laughs> you want have, an eight? Uh, Listen, Alan, are you have your <laughs> yeah, pilot's I'll come license? By and pick you up. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Look, you could call up Ted Turner. He's got a private plane. He does. And he'll come pick There's you up. Many private planes. <laughs> yeah, I saw one once when I landed in, uh, um, I think it was Bozeman. Yeah, that could have been one of his. A little airport there. They said that's Ted Turner's plane over there. It's some property in Paradise Valley, which is a lovely place. The uh, Viruses and Cells Gordon Conference needs your help. The 2019 meeting next year uh, needs your support to be able to pay for registration and travel costs for 32 speakers, 18 discussion leaders, selected students, and postdocs being organized by two virologists, Julie Pfeiffer and Britt Glaudensinger. And you can donate some money to help them out. There is a link which we will provide in the um, show notes Unfortunately, it's very long, so if I said it, you wouldn't remember it. So you have to go to the microbe.tv slash twiv, and you'll see a link there. They would be grateful for your support. We have a few follow-up emails this week. The first is from David, who writes, Dear Twivnicks, R.E. Twiv, 505, here's a thought on potential mechanisms for involvement of virus immunity in Alzheimer's disease. I'm sure I read somewhere the notion that the capacity of cells to dispose of protein aggregates, misfolded or otherwise, could be a factor in progressive cellular damage. In the context of viral infection, efficient clearance, clearance of complexes consisting of virus components and antiviral proteins like amyloid might prevent their accumulation in neurons. Excess viral replication or decreased protein turnover capacity related to metabolism and aging, could upset the balance. The complexes could accumulate and over time contribute to cell destruction. The effect doesn't need to be large at all. Neurons don't turn over, and there are decades for pathology to manifest. Sure, it could be. It could probably is one of many things that, that, are, that are going on. Very true. Mm-hmm. How to test it, though. That's the problem. Indeed. You know? I mean, you have to fool with protein turnover in some way. And you have to do it in an animal, obviously. Mm -hmm. That's the key. An animal who shows signs of Alzheimer's. Yep. Right. Right. 
Twiv keeps getting be- even better. Brienne is a great addition to the team. It's cool that the podcast still works well, even when all six of you comprise the panel. <laughs> Some would say it doesn't. It. Some people have said we, we talk over each other, but it's okay. It gets a little crowded. Yeah, It yeah. does. It's well, fine. thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Good to know you're a good addition. The check right? is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> also, thank you for your kind mention of our former chair and colleague, Dick Courtney, who passed away last year, I guess. Hmm. It's 31C87F in Hershey. Right. There are clouds and sun and storms possible this afternoon. Two weeks ago, we had days of downpours that flooded Hershey Park and made it difficult to get around. It's pretty much back to normal now. Hopefully, the weather will cooperate for Vincent's visit to Penn State Hershey in the fall. Can't wait. Truth to be told, I've been agitating for a while for such a visit to little avail. (laughs) Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. a postdoc here who is a Twix fan made an independent request unbeknownst to me and the powers that be listened to him. Cool. In Viro Veritas, <laughs> David is a professor of emeritus of microbiology and immunology, Penn State Hershey. Where the chocolate is all melting, I guess. Maybe you'd like to fly down for that twiv, Alan. I probably, yeah, actually Hershey's not too bad to get to. Mm-hmm. Let me, um, I will email you the details. Look for the big yeah. silver kiss. I'm on pretty the sure they want a twiv and, uh, it sounds like David, of course, would be very excited right. to have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hershey, where is the Hershey visit? Mm. Penn State, October 31st. Uh, it's like oh, Halloween. Well, wait, a Halloween. perfect time to go to the candy place. Oh, you exactly. could trick and treat. I don't know if you're allowed to leave Halloween yet. Your daughter is still young. Twiv and treat. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I'd, have, I, I'd probably have to be back. Uh, yeah, well, I will, yeah, right. I'll, that evening. I'll but. give you the details. I'll let you know. Okay. All right, Alan, can you take the next one? Yes. Um, so Niraj writes, Dear Twivers, I hope you're doing great and that the summer has been productive for you. Even though it's been a while since I last wrote in, I've been religiously indulging in the scientific wisdom from up and beyond your Twimf series. Mm-hmm. And while hearing your discussion about AD on the latest TWIF 505, I was taken back to the memory to uh, back to memory lane as a lowly graduate student when I used to work on the aggregation kinetics of amyloid beta 42 peptide. Yeah. In some regard, it's a bit depressing to know that even after decades of investigation, our understanding of the factors contributing to the passive pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease is quite naive. The amyloid hypothesis is always at the crux, but there is always a group of investigators who believes the soluble oligomers are the major culprits for spewing neuronal neuronal toxicity. Obviously, the complexity that comes with investigating an age-dependent ailment is hard to simplify, but the growing need to generate better diagnostics is definitely uh, needed now. And in this regard, reading about the role of herpes virus and the postulated antimicrobial role of A-beta-42 is quite intriguing. It's certainly a very interesting start, but there's a long road before the um, before one connects correlation to causation. I'm optimistic that with such innovative science, one day we will have a better understanding of the underlying framework that promotes AD. Mm-hmm. Overall, I really enjoyed the discussion, but then a question popped into my head, which I thought I would run by you curious souls. So my understanding is the majority of the cases of Alzheimer's disease are sporadic, but there's a small fraction, about 5%, that are familial. In these situations, like the Swedish mutation, there's either an overproduction of the culprit amyloid beta-42 or the mutation generates an aberrant A-beta-42 that has much higher propensity to aggregate than the wild type. So is it known if in those cases having a herpes virus infection is uh, not necessary or causal? I guess maybe in those situations, the overproduction of amyloid beta-42 gets over the energy barrier to promote self-aggregation that leads to the generation of amyloid plaques. Also, structurally, a beta-42 peptide is present at the core of the membrane protein, amyloid precursor protein, and is generated by the sequential proteolytic cleavage of beta and gamma secretases. Is this event, too, promoted by the herpes virus virus infection? Maybe. But then again, when I think about the timeline and how long it takes to become symptomatic of Alzheimer's disease, I fail to reconcile the proteolytic activity and its effect on pathology. Overall, I do think these novel insights can certainly help shape our understanding of this debilitating ailment, and maybe, just maybe, someday we might have a treatment, if not cure, for people and families affected by this global disease. 
Unlike many other diseases with Alzheimer's disease, it's not only the emotional aspect, but a rapidly growing financial aspect of caretaking that is certainly going to hit every country's GDP Mm -hmm. as we age more and live longer lives. Uh, well, with that sobering thought, I just want to commend your passion. Want to commend your passion for discussing these relevant topics and making the general audience like me aware and understand, helping us understand the difficulties of the art that is research and development. And Niraj is a scientist at Sutravax, so not exactly the general audience, but um, mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> well, those are good questions. You know, they yes. they were not they addressed are. in the paper. Whether you know these familial cases have a virus component or maybe they're independent could be more than one way to trigger ad right yep. mm-hmm. and it's a good question I, you know in in the tissues that were studied in that uh, herpes paper that we did they didn't segregate them according to what mutations were present yeah in these that genes. would be that yeah. would be a whole separate study didn't but that would be an interesting study to see yeah Yes, and, uh, and whether the virus induces cleavage of the precursor, amyloid precursor, is also another good mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it may have been looked at before because this hypothesis has been circulating around for a while, but I'm not aware of, of the results. Would organoids help to resolve the issue now that we can do that? Um, brain organoids? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Not sure that. What would you look for? I mean, yeah, I understand. No, to see if you can infect them with herpes uh, and then see whether or not it triggers the amyloid precursor or stuff like that. It's an early uh, onset. Well, here is a paper, 3D cerebral organoids as models for Alzheimer's disease. Ba-boom. It was published in, well, it's it's an abstract from 2017. Yeah. Okay. So let's see, how would they... um, how would they do a model for? <laughs> well, they're looking at amyloid beta deposition, basically. Right. So that's one, ad, but that's only part of the whole no, no, disease, right? Totally great, totally. I guess you could do that part. So, yes, it's a good question. Okay. Now, just this past week, someone came in my office, though I will not say who, and they said they got a call from one of their aging parents whose partner got a call from this medical center asking if they would be interested in participating in a trial for treating Alzheimer's disease with an anti-herpes virus drug. Interesting. Wow. This, this week. I mean, uh, <laughs> apparently. They must listening. have been listening to Twiv. There so, they're, so they're enrolling for a trial, and that means it's been in preparation for a while, yeah. right? Because these things don't happen in four days. Right. But mm. this shows the importance of any potential treatment for this disease, right? Sure. Yeah. I was just stunned. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a completely (laughs) unmet medical need. And, um, you know, gansiclovir is fairly low risk, so why not? Mm -hmm. I think that they were going to treat for two years and then measure, you know, markers, stuff. Right. Right. Cool. And Uh, these are in patients, I suppose, who already have Alzheimer's or already have dementia? So in this particular case, this person had gone in to be tested to see if they were developing. So I I don't think they had Alzheimer's, but maybe they want to get people who have gone in for testing and maybe, I don't know, as a control group or something. I just don't know. I don't know. All right. A couple of news items caught my eye this week. Uh, they have to do with the recent outbreak of Ebola virus in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is the second outbreak. It was one earlier in the summer, uh, which ended, and then as that ended and was declared ended, there was a second. Um, and um, this apparently, there's an article here in uh, Outbreak News Radio, which says that this is a new strain of virus. So it's a uh, a new spillover, as we had hypothesized or speculated last time. Um, there are 43 cases, 16 confirmed, 27 probable, 46 under investigation, two deaths. And this is dated uh, August 8th. In the last, two days ago. Last sentence. So it's a different virus, different spillover. And they say the first team of vaccinators will arrive today. So they're going to be vaccinating. 
And, and they are apparently, um, they are, they they have armed guards uh, escorting these vaccinators around because this area of DRC is, um, I guess, in worse shape than the area where the previous outbreak was, which is kind of saying something. So. Yeah, uh, I think I've seen a lot of ProMed posts about this recently, um, and they were even talking about whether some of the um, unrest in the area um, raise questions about the use of ring vaccination, um, whether mm-hmm. they could actually make a good ring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a sci- an article in The Scientist on, on the vaccination, which says, as Alan says, this is a very different area. This is an active conflict zone. Hmm. Yes, a war that, zone. As we know mm-hmm. from polio yeah. of, of immunization, that uh, that can impede the oh, ability yeah. to immunize people. When you shoot the vaccinators, you have trouble yes. vaccinating. A bit, yes. I like to, the quote at the end yes, of this, um, go ahead, this article. That. from uh, It's from Peter Salama, who heads the World Health Organization Health Emergencies Program. Uh, and he says, On the scale of degree of difficulty, trying to extinguish an outbreak of a deadly high-threat pathogen in a war zone reaches the top of any of our scales. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll keep an eye on that. It's good we have a vaccine to do that. I hope it works. Definitely. Well, I'm not sure. And, we'll, and I hope we start getting better data on whether it works. Well, that's the problem. We have 30, 40, 50 cases, and it's hard. Yeah. There's no, con- and, and, no controls, right? They're just doing ring, ring vaccination in these. Which cases. is what you have to do. And then you, you know, and these areas are, it's hard to keep track of people. And, you know, I guess some of them are probably getting shot. And um, it's it's a difficult situation in which to do a clinical mm-hmm. trial. So I'm certainly not picking on the folks who are trying to get those data together, but it would be nice to uh, to find out what's going on with the vaccine. Well, you know, I think they're just going to go in in every outbreak and immunize. And, and use it. Yeah. And, you know, mostly these outbreaks, with the big exception in West Africa, they don't go very many people, usually less than 100 at the most, a few hundred. And it would be interesting to see if they're all limited to 30, 40, because you get yeah. it quickly and that's it. And there's well, never any, but that'll take time to accumulate that, right? Yeah, but I mean, at, at the same time, they're going to get safety data and efficacy, yes, in antibody induction data. So yes, that will accumulate automatically. And to the extent that there is that there are functioning systems in Democratic Republic of Congo, um, they are obviously very aware of this virus now and how to handle it, and hopefully, containment procedures are being put in in place properly. Right. Agreed. All right, our paper today is is this topic I've wanted to do for a while. And this is published last year in Scientific Reports. Cryo-EM reconstruction of the cafeteria Rhone-Bergensis virus capsid suggests novel assembly pathway for giant viruses. So this has been on my radar for a long time because uh, this virus, cafeteria Rhone-Bergensis virus, uh, was discovered some time ago by Matthias Fischer. Matthias runs these giant virus meetings in Germany. I went to the first one about six years ago. I met the lead author on this study, uh, Xuan Shao, who calls himself River, and he is now at University of Texas El Paso. He has some interesting videos also. He's a very interesting guy. <laughs> very I, good I, videos. I met him in Germany, and then he and I took the train back to the airport. We spent a couple of hours chatting on the train. He was a former postdoc of Michael Rossman, and he's just a nice guy and a funny guy and has a good sense of humor. If you go to his website, you know, you can see a picture of him with a cowboy hat, yes. <laughs> which is really funny. And he makes movies. Now, this virus, uh, Cafeteria Rome Bergensis virus, you know, was isolated a while ago. And he's had pictures of the structure for a long time on his website. I always show them in my lectures because it's, a, it's really a cool structure, but he hasn't finished it. And I ran into him at ASV just a few weeks ago. And he said the structure came out last year. I said, oh, I missed it totally. So mm-hmm. I wanted to do this because it gives us an opportunity to talk about uh, the virus and the structure, which is really interesting. Cafeteria Rowan Bergensis, wonderful name. First of all, yes. the, the author, Sean, Sean Shaw is the first author. Matthias Fisher is on this paper because he identified the virus originally in Curtis Suttle's lab. Um, so Curtis is the PI and uh, Sean is um, 
has been working on the structure uh, in his own laboratory. Can and hear, um, Sh- Shaw and Fisher are co-first authors. They're co-first authors. Can, so, can we do the inst- institutions? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, right, so this was done by folks at, at UT El Paso, Max Planck, and Heidelberg, University of British Columbia, and uh, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research in Toronto. We've, we've done a, a series of Curtis Subtle papers recently on my various podcasts. Oh. You know, we've done many of, many of his stories on TWIV. Just did one on TWIM yesterday. You remember Bodo Salins? Right. Is that the running? Saltans. Saltans virus was from his jumps. laboratory. Yeah, yeah. So then this one, uh, Hafeteria romburgensis is a marine zooplankton. It's a single-celled eukaryote. <laughs> And it has the name cafeteria because it eats many things. You get it, Dixon? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I looked that no, up no, and I really liked it. He asked me. Now, come on, let me answer. Um, I'm still thinking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they call it a bacterivore, but it eats other things as well. And they found that it's infected by a giant virus. That's the, the cool part of this story. It's a giant virus. It's big. And it's big. so it's cafeteria Rome Bergensis virus, Crow V. And it was identified a number of years ago before we had bigger, now we have bigger viruses. Um, it's 3,000 angstroms in diameter, so it's not the biggest uh, giant virus. Uh, meme, some meme viruses are bigger. Pithovirus, Sibiricum is bigger, but um, it uh, it's quite interesting. So River has been trying to do the structure of this for a long time. And I remember in, in, uh, in Germany at the first giant virus meeting he presented some of these data it had not yet been published and he said there are so many atoms in the structure that it crashes every computer he tries to display it on so this was done by cryo em which is as we've talked about uh, it's getting more and more used to to study structures because uh, the, the computational aspects have been developed the equipment is getting better and better and it's getting down to really high resolutions. You don't need crystals. You just need to freeze the particles and take lots of pictures of them. So you, you and in fact, this year's Nobel prizes went for the technology behind cryo EM, right. the mm-hmm. the the freezing technology and the collection of data and the processing and so forth. So that's what they used uh, to solve the structure of this virus. Um, <laughs> They mentioned in the in the introduction that so you freeze this in vitreous ice, freeze it very quickly, and you get that generates the contrast you need to see the particles. So you don't do any staining, right? And the, they say the thickness of the ice that embeds the capsid is one of the most important factors limiting the resolution. Because if you have very thick ice, you get multiple and inelastic scattering of electrons. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what inelastic mm-hmm. scattering is, but. Mm-hmm. And that reduces the signal to noise ratio. So they had to work out the images here. Um, and you have to freeze the particles and then take pictures of thousands of them. So for this work, they purified the virus from 40 liters of infected cafeteria Rome Bergensis cultures. Wow. And they took pictures of 6,698 individual particles. So that's a little over 12 gallons. Or 10, 10 gallons? It's about 10 gallons, right? 10, 10 11 gallons, yeah. something like that. So you take pictures, and the idea is that every picture is in a, is a slightly different orientation. Then you can use those kind of like a CAT scan to assemble a three-dimensional representation of the virus. Uh, they re, they needed 3 million C, yes. CPU hours. Wow. I assume they used multiple CPUs. That's a lot of CPU time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And they ended up with a 21 angstrom resolution of it. This is by this is about 10 times uh, greater, less than what you can actually achieve from cryo EM. But it's the best they could do with these big particles. Right. And that uh, that tells them a lot about the the structure, which I'd like to talk about a little bit here. So the so the structure that they solved, they're looking at one protein. I was I was a little unclear on this because in the discussion they get back to the fact that there are multiple proteins that make up this capsid, but they're looking at the one mainly made by the major capsid protein. That's right. That's right. This is all made up of the major capsid protein. It's one It's one repeated many, many times, something like 29,000 times in the capsid. And 
it makes so this protein, this major capsid protein, is exceedingly typical as a virus capsid protein. It's built by an architecture called a jelly roll fold. Jelly roll. Because yes. it looks, to the original crystallographers, it looked like a jelly roll. Now, I don't even know what a jelly roll looks like. Has anyone ever had a jelly roll? <laughs> no, it's a oh, jelly sure. roll. If you curl your hand up, you can almost, you know, you roll yeah, it. It's, you roll it's it. actually a lot like a Swiss roll, which was that oh, okay. uh, the Swiss roll. They call it the Swiss, intestinal thing. Um, they, that's right. They call them Swiss jelly rolls. or, or yeah. they, Another word is Greek key for these protein folds. But the, the technically, it's a, it's a structure. It's a wedge-shaped structure, and these pack together to form the particle right. made of eight anti-parallel beta strands. You have the same structure in poliovirus and many picornas, many plant viruses. In fact, when Rossman first mm-hmm. crystallized a plant virus and a picorna, he said, my gosh, it's the same fold. It's the jelly roll fold. It's origami. Now, it's not the only fold that is used to build viruses, but it's a very common one. So here in this giant virus, you have eight anti-parallel beta strand jelly rolls. And uh, the particle is made up of two kinds of arrangements of this protein. Um, there is one where it's, it's what they call pseudo-hexagonal. It has six jelly rolls in three capsid proteins. Okay, so it's, it's obviously multimerized, and that's a pseudo-hexagonal shape. And then the vertices, and I should... Back up just a moment and say this this virus is built with icosahedral symmetry, which means that you know an icosahedron is a geometric shape that has twenty sides, twenty sides tw- which are pentameric and has five so triangular sides. Sorry, not pentameric. It has five fold axes of symmetry. Now these particles are not actually icosahedra; they're spherical, but their proteins are arranged with icosahedral symmetry, and so the five fold axis has pentameric capsomers, and they think those are single jelly roll proteins as opposed to the rest of the surface of the particle, which is made up these of these pseudo-hexagonal pentamers, and, uh, hexamers, pseudo-hexagonal uh, capsomers. So one of the ways you describe a, a virus particle is by what's called the triangulation number. So let, let's back up, and I've put a nice figure in the show notes that I use for teaching. The simplest an icosahedron is, is, is a nice way to build virus particles because you can make a particle with just one protein repeated 60 times. It's, that is, those are the simplest viruses that we know of. They're called T, they have triangulation number of T equals one. Now, the triangulation number is a way of describing how many protein subunits there are in each of the triangles of the icosahedron. So the way I look at it is, you know, each face of the icosahedron, each triangular face can be built of multiple subunits. And the number, the T number tells you how many different subunits build up that triangular face. So for a T equals one virus, you have one subunit. It's repeated three times. And for more complicated viruses, you can increase the, the T number. So you can make the triangle bigger. Make it bigger. You just put more subunits. In fact, that's how you right. make bigger viruses. You don't make the proteins bigger. You just put more of them into the capsid. And as you insert more viruses, the T number goes up. And as soon as you leave T equals one, you now introduce new kinds of symmetry into the particle. So the T equals one particle has five-fold symmetry throughout. As soon as you put more subunits in and increase the T number, you now have both five-fold and six-fold axes of symmetry. So you're building with pentamers and hexamers, and that's why this virus and many others that are big have pentamers and hexamers, because the only way you can build the particle by adding more subunits is, in, is to introduce this hexamer into the particle. So that's the simple way of uh, describing a T number is by saying that's the number of subunits per, uh, per face. But there's a mathematical way, of course, of describing it. There's a formula where you, you can measure the axes along the icosahedral faces, and there's a, a formula in the paper if you're interested. I always tell my students it's the number of subunits per face of the triangle. I think that's easier to... And they, they, I tell them the same thing. <laughs> I think it's just easier, and I say, if you want to know more, some of them want to know the basis for it. Here's the mathematical formula. Yeah, so the paper is open access. Their particle T number 
is 499. <laughs> this is a big virus. So polio virus is a pseudo T equals three, for example, by comparison. 499 is big. Now, from the T number, you can calculate the total number of subunits in the particle. It's 60 times T, right? Because the simplest particle is made of 60 subunits, and if you're increasing them by T number, you just multiply it times T. So 60 times 499 is 29,940 subunits. In this paper, I don't know if you noticed, they never tell you how many subunits are in this particle because they, they, they can't measure it. It's very hard to do. For smaller particles, you could disrupt them and run them on gels and get an idea of the molarity, perhaps, but this is big. So you do a calculation. If you figure out the T number, you can say 29,940 major capsid protein subunits. doesn't even take into account the other ones. Dixon. Impressive. I do have a question, and that just arose in my head as I was trying to think of how these things get together inside of a cell, for instance, as they're assembling. What holds them together? Is this, we're talking about weak forces like Van der Waals forces? Or? Well, what's holding smaller, the subunits? Smaller, smaller viruses are held together by non covalent forces. Non covalent. They are mostly non covalent because. Why? They have to come apart again when right. they infect the cell, yeah, well, that's right? That's the idea. That's, that's They're mostly. Exactly. However, there are always exceptions. There must be. In biology, right? Always. Always. There are some viruses where the capsid is built like chain mail, Dixon. I'm looking at your Ebola. You're there. looking at Ebola. I am. Chain mail. Chain mail. They're all locked together. Cantonated. Yes. And so how to get those apart is an interesting problem. But for the most part, they're non-covalent. Magicians have no problem with. But as the as the <laughs> as the particles get bigger, there are other proteins that are in there, and they're thought to be glue to hold glue. the other proteins together. Well, it's obviously not glue, but there are obviously some kind of interactions that are right. going on. Linkers. That's why adenoviruses famously have other proteins, minor proteins that are not the major capsid protein that help the other state. Do, do any viruses incorporate host proteins into their capsid? For sure. Oh, definitely. So mm -hmm. they don't need a genome for that particular part of it. They do not. They steal it from the host That's cell. That's very interesting. because they're parasites. They are. And if the host has a mutation of that protein, does it still work? <laughs> like, is this an escape mechanism for the host, perhaps? It's an interesting question. Hmm. Not, I'm not aware of any examples of that at the moment. I, I think, think in most cases, in most cases, the virus is going to be able to outmaneuver the host. No kidding. You know, I knew this. I, yeah, just by sheer numbers. Now, do you remember Mimi virus? It's an icosahedral capsule. It's big, but it has these fib sure. these fibers, these little hairy fibers sticking out from it all around, which they mention here makes it hard to figure out the, uh, the structure. They have to cut them off. In fact, there's a famous picture when the first structure of Mimi virus came out. It had a little scissors next to it that had cut off all the hairs. <laughs> they had figured out a way to cleave them proteolytically, but isn't that funny? That is. I think that's that's structural biology humor, right? Yes. They yes. they nerdy. have a nice um, comment here about that sort of gives you an idea of sort of how well they've done technically. Um, you know, their T number is four hundred and ninety nine, and they say that the previous highly or highest accurately determined T number was 277. Right. Um, and that they guess that Mimi virus would have a, a T number of about a thousand, but that they can't actually yep. determine that. Yeah. It's very cool. So these particles, these crow, crow V virus, they don't have these fibers on the surface. This is a kind of a naked capsimer, but there are surface projections. If you look at the pictures and, and I, and I suggest you look at the paper because it's hard to describe all of this, and it's open access. So it's a very, so yeah. very image-oriented paper. You can see that you can see the individual structural units, and they're sticking out. And he said because this is because the these beta rolls, the, the beta strands, have insertions at the ends, and these make for the surface uh, projections. Um, they. Some of these other giant viruses have portals where they think the DNA can go in and come out. Uh, herpes viruses, famously herpes simplex, have one portal per particle where the DNA goes in during packaging and comes out during infection. And uh, Mimi viruses has what's called a Stargate portal, <laughs> which they think opens up <laughs> to let the, the DNA out. 
So they look for a portal here, and he thinks maybe there is one, but can't really tell if there is a portal. Mm. Another feature of this particle uh, seems to be there's a membrane underneath the capsid shell. They can see this in electron micrographs. And there, there are other viruses that have membranes inside of protein shells. It's kind of an interesting thing. All right, but the main thing here is that they have the structure. And now the, what I think is a really cool part is they talk about how this might assemble. So n- a number of years ago, people proposed that the, the subunits of these big viruses assemble first, and then they form a particle. And, for example, there is a virus called Ceres, this iridescent virus. Uh, they seem to be assembled from preformed major capsid proteins. On this particle, if you look at the pictures, you can see that there are five-fold associated subunits and threefold associated subunits. And these have a cool name, which were given a long time ago, pentasymmetrons <laughs> and trisymmetrons. I don't know. It brings I back, am the pentasymmetron. Yeah, it's, Fear it's, me. Lord yes. of the Rings. <laughs> Star Trek, it brings back all these yes. science. Or Lord of the Cantonated Rings. <laughs> <laughs> the pentasymmetron may come through the Stargate. Exactly. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and so capture the, your cell. <laughs> if you look at the first pictures in this paper, the pentasymmetrons are the structures at the fivefold axis of symmetry, the pentagons. And the, the trisymmetrons are the bigger portions, triangles making up the rest of the particle. And they say... They can they the capsimeres have different orientations in these individual subunits. So he's colored them according to the orientation. But he said in the in the reconstructions you can actually see the dividing line between the penta and the trisymmetrons because the capsimeres are rotated, which is really cool. The boundaries are are defined. And he says that in other uh, giant viruses you can see similar features. You can see how these subunits are, are rotated and, and different from each other. So they think he thinks because of this they're all sem- assembled in a similar manner. Now, if, if you look at the assembly at the fivefold axis of symmetry, this is the penta symmetron. One of the six capsimers has a different orientation compared to the other five, and the other five are rotated sixty degrees. So he says, if you color the capsimers, again, in the pentasymmetron, according to the orientation, you get a spiral pattern that resembles five interlocked golf club heads. Yes. And so he, <laughs> they, he, they redraw it in this way in figure four. And it's brilliant. <laughs> it kind of show, shows you how they interlock at the fivefold axis, right? And then from the fivefold axis, then it fans out and becomes the uh, trisymmetron, which is the rest of the particle. And then he says you can do the same thing with um, chlorella virus and other giant viruses as well. So they think, and this is based on some in vitro assembly data with other viruses, that assembly starts at the five-fold vertex and proceeds radially to complete the shell because they don't find any intermediates inside the cell. So that he thinks you don't make big triangular subunits and then put them together, right. but you start at the five-fold axis and subunits begin to associate in a radial pattern. So here's how he describes it. Capsimers assemble around the pentameric capsimer, forming five triangles each for the third layer. Instead of extending the triangle, one capsimer will spiral into the counterclockwise neighboring triangle. This differently oriented capsimer will then seed the trisymmetron by recruiting more capsimers. There's a movie which is part of the, uh, I played it. the, the it's data. It's, it's also cool. on his website, which exactly shows how this happens. And I, you should watch it because we'll put a link directly to it because it shows. Exactly I wish I could how. get the full screen. It would have been. A cool yeah. The spiral screen. assembly is very cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he kind of took it one step further. He has another movie of the virus being going down a spiral drain in of water. Vortex. Of vortex. Of vortex <laughs> right. So I guess he, you know, thought is the ultimate <laughs> it's got some music some funny it does. Music it actually right? does yeah it is well it is a, 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 a marine virus so yeah yeah so there's no experimental support for this spiral assembly idea but he says you know it could be tested but it comes from looking at the structure not just this virus but other giant viruses as well so i think that's the cool part it's a very unique structure and uh, it is, seems to assemble differently. 
Yeah. So 21 angstrom, big virus particle, 29,000 subunits, largest T number reported to date. By the way, these trisimetrons are composed of 231 capsimeres each. And they, they have this spiral mechanism of uh, assembly proposed. So I think it's... How many cool. total proteins in the capsid? So the major capsid protein, just that alone, 29,940 based on the T number. I mean different proteins, I'm sorry. How many total uh, different proteins? Yeah. Right, so this major capsid protein is the, the major one. Um, but then they, Good. <laughs> and, and what they're, what they're talking about throughout the paper is this one protein assembling the particle right. and that's kind of their model and they build, build the model around that. And then they, they concede in the discussion, um, that there are other proteins involved in building the capsid, mm. which could either feed into their model or undermine it. Um, so there's, there, this is not a complete picture and, um, and it's important to note that the, um, as they as they readily concede, they don't have direct data that this is the way the virus is assembling. Um, but the fact that you that it could work this way and that this makes a, a whole lot of sense, and that you don't see any big chunks of intermediates floating around that would be yeah. stuck together instead, so there there isn't any evidence supporting any other models either. Um, and this one at least uh, at least seems to make sense mathematically and topologically. So there are 60 copies of what's called capsid protein 2 and 1 to 2 copies of capsid proteins 3 and 4. Right. So way less than the 29,990 of the major capsid protein. Right. Right. And those could actually be involved in some kind of um, – in inducing some kind of small asymmetry – that maybe you don't see at the resolution they were able to do here mm -hmm. that, gives mm -hmm. the, that gives you some sort of stargate or pore yeah. um, and would, would give a spot for the virus to uncoat. Because the other problem here, as you pointed out earlier, is after you built this whole thing, you have to unbuild it in order for the genome to get out in the next host. And if everything is equally strong, where does the capsid fall apart to release the genome? Right. Right. So it's really pretty. Um, Check it out. Go to his website. Play the movies. They're a lot yes, of fun. A lot of fun. Um, and, and very helpful, too. <laughs> yes. Uh, congratulations on Dude. getting this big structure. I missed it. It was a year ago, but there it is. Yep. And it's, as structural biology papers go, this one is, is I found, quite approachable. It is. Yes, it is. You know, they do a little bit of math, but it's not, um, it's not difficult to understand, and their model really makes sense once you look at the pictures. Right. All right. So our first email actually has a paper I want to discuss a little bit also. This is from Waitama. Hello, Twiv team. My hometown just had its fourth year in a row dengue free. This is following the initial Wolbachia release in 2014. One less danger to worry about here in the tropics. And Waitama spend, sends a, a Smithsonian Magazine article along. Uh, Uitama is a PhD candidate at James Cook University, and I looked up the original paper to dis to discuss this a little bit. And first of all, this is published in Gates Open Research, which is a kind of a bioarchive like site supported by the Gates Foundation, hmm. and you can put your preprints there until they get reviewed. So they're paying for this, the Gates Foundation. I had not known about this before. Uh, and then it's called Scaled Deployment of Wolbachia to Protect the Community from 80s Transmitted Arboviruses. That tells you the progress of the refereeing uh, situation as well. Mm -hmm. First author is Scott O'Neill. Last author is Cameron Simmons. And they are from uh, Monash University and James Cook University, both, of course, in Australia. We've talked a little bit before about the idea that Wolbachia is an intracellular bacterium that's present in many insects in the world, but it's not present in 80s aegypti. And if you introduce it into 80s aegypti cells or whole mosquitoes, it inhibits the replication of dengue, Zika virus, chikungunya, and other viruses as well. So the idea has arose, why don't we 
put Wolbachia into Aedes aegypti and then release them. We talked about this a long time ago. The Wolbachia itself provides a drive for the bacterium in the population. So these will predominate and eventually displace mosquitoes that are already out there if you release enough of them. And the idea being, of course, that maybe you could interrupt dengue transmission, which is transmitted by Aedes aegypti. And I don't remember what the la- the twiv was that we did this on. It was a long time ago. We talked about what Wolbachia is doing, how it drives, and so mm-hmm, forth. Mm-hmm. And this is a study done in uh, Australia in a community where they did the release and they measured the effect. And I think it's worth talking about a little bit because it's just an amazing, it's a large-scale deployment. This is Townsville, medium-sized city in northern Australia, 187,000 residents. And there's the science, which is cool, but the other part is the community engagement. Yes. They had to, you know, work with the community and tell them what they were going to do and, and, you know, listen to their questions and just basically convince them that this was a good idea because maybe they didn't want to do it. And what I thought is cool is part of the paper is describing how they did community engagement. Um, They got the school kids involved in releasing the mosquitoes. They have, you know, instead of having just the scientists do it, they have school kids and they provide them with buckets. They call them Wolbachia warriors, (laughs) right? (laughs) And they have a procedure for doing that. And so eventually they were able to do all this. So, just a couple details, which I find amazing. They they had to establish a colony for this in the first place. So they mm-hmm. collected wild mosquito eggs from 49 sites across Townsville. And they produce a colony, and then they introduce Wolbachia into it. They had to make 800,000 eggs a week. I think they ended up releasing 4 million mosquitoes among all the different parts of, of Townsville over this four years. And that if you're interested, this is an open access paper. They have real details on the breeding and how they maintained it and so forth and how they were released in these plastic buckets. And then, of course, they measured the, they caught mosquitoes in the wild and they said, do they have Wolbachia? Right. And they would keep releasing, I think they did it every week, until half of the mosquitoes were Wolbachia positive, then they stopped. But they kept monitoring them. Um, and these, <laughs> yeah, this is very cool. Once you reach 50%, then most of these areas that they sampled, oh, most of them went up to 100% on their own just by the reproduction and the drive of this Wolbachia in the community. It's really remarkable. Yep. Yes. Right? And if you look, they have some cool graphs of these different um, areas of Townsend. Most of them are a hundred percent. So it starts in 2015, and then by a year later, most of them are a hundred percent positive for Wolbachia. I, I'm just stunned that this actually works. I guess it actually I works. Yes, because they yeah. shouldn't be stunned. So they started releasing in October 2014. Lasted for 28 months, uh, and they eventually. Um, you know, got over 80% Wolbachia positive in all these communities, which they say shows that the Wolbachia is stable in 80s Egypti because they didn't know if it was going to be stable. And then, so what's the effect on dengue? They have had epide- epidemics of locally transmitted dengue every year in this community since 2001. Mm. Every year, I think about 90 to 100 cases every year. Since the release of these mosquitoes, They've had four dengue cases, and only one of them is seems to be uh, in an area where they put their Wolbachia containing mosquitoes. And not even sure if that's imported case or not. Mm. So they had no no dengue in the four years where they've done this release. It's amazing. amazing. It's amazing. I I just I think it's great because yes, it works. It seems to be a minimally disruptive procedure, right? It's just right. One, one species of mosquito. They're not going to mate with other species and transmit to Wolbachia because that's what a species is, right? Mm-hmm. True. And it looks like dengue transmission is uh, is gone. And importantly, this does not kill the mosquitoes. 
Yeah, it doesn't. So there's the um, we've talked about other methods along these lines, gene drives and things like that, where you would use them as an eradication strategy and mm-hmm. wipe out yeah. a, a species in an area, and that could work extremely well. It would likely work very well if you got the technology up and running properly and actually did the release. Um, but there's a lot of controversy surrounding that, uh, even among biologists, mm, because yeah, if you're yeah. talking about eradicating a species deliberately, I mean, humans have eradicated hundreds of species already. <laughs> um, but now we're going to go and do it deliberately, even if it's something like Aedes aegypti or Anopheles gambii that causes tremendous amount of suffering you have to wonder what the long-term ecological consequences of that mm, are. Sure. Mm-hmm. Here, the Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes are still out there. They're still feeding. They're still reproducing. They're doing all their normal things. They're supporting whatever other parasites they would support, but they just can't sustain um, and act as vectors for the viruses that you're concerned about. So what things would we look for to see if we've made any disruptions by doing this? Is there, is there anything obvious? Hospital admits. For oh, you mean disruptions to the to the ecology? Oh, yeah, yeah. to the, the ecosystem. ecosystem. Right, so yeah. Nice. Um, look at insectivores. Look at birds that's and right. bats. That's right. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. feed on on these mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. And see if they are. It, it it's gonna. It, it might be tough to measure against other factors that are affecting bird and bat populations worldwide. But if you see something changing in those populations, then this is a possible culprit that you should be on the list of things to look into. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than that, I guess, um, maybe fish, um, and other insect species, especially in aquatic environments yep, that feed yep. on larvae or yeah, tadpoles that eat, uh, the tadpoles, uh, tumblers right. and things of that sort. Yeah, that's right. Now, I don't believe that a wolbachia will infect those other species, no. right? So that's not no. an issue. Yeah. Nope. I think this is ama- I think this will provide impetus for people to do it elsewhere. This is the first right. large scale release. There have been a couple of smaller ones. Yeah. But I think this is going to drive global use of this. Yeah. I would love yeah, to see that happen. Wouldn't that be amazing? They had very few alternatives. For I this mean, thing. you know, to if you read this, you see it wasn't trivial to do the breeding. It's yeah. they have a complicated right. process. No. And they say that they want to get this down to a cost of less than a dollar per person. Right. The, the advantage of 80s is that the eggs can be stored dry. Right. And you can accumulate right. until you're ready to le- release them. But a buck a person, not, I don't think that's un- – that's probably cheaper than a vaccine. <laughs> Figure out right. what yeah, the damage of dengue <laughs> yeah, is to yeah. the a, a dollar, a dollar per, per resident of an area where you're going to do this, in other words. Yeah. So this obviously has to be mechanized in some way where you could bring it anywhere. Yes. Well, and I think probably you need to get local mosquitoes and start with them, right? You can't just take Good. this Australian yeah. mosquito and put it elsewhere because they're going to be genetically different. But anyway, I, I, it's just cool. Thank you, Weetama, for yes. pointing this out. And I think it's great. I can't wait to see more of this. And Weetama is a PhD candidate at James Cook University, yes. which is one of the places involved in this. And you can go to uh, Weetama.com. And uh, you can see Weetama there with a turtle. Yes, apparently into turtles. He's into <laughs> virology, turtles, and pythons. Yeah, well, huh. Python Python computer code, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, language. yeah, right. that could be. That was confusing at first, too. I, said, I, I saw viruses, turtles, python. Wait. Oh, right, python. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Barbara writes, Hello, TWIV team. Long-time listener, first time writing into TWIV. I am writing to express my gratitude for all of you for the time and effort that goes into putting together a great TWIV every week. And Vincent, thank you for the entire Twix family of podcasts. As a microbiologist by training, but no longer working in a lab because of health reasons, being able to listen to these podcasts is very rewarding and keeps me grounded in science. I was delighted to find out that we listeners now have a way to support Microbe TV through Patreon. I've wanted to contribute in some way since first getting hooked on the Twix podcasts. As a new monthly Patreon contributor, I'd like to encourage other listeners to contribute as well. I'm happy to give up one Starbucks grande latte a month for my (laughs) Twix addiction. (laughs) What surprises me is that there are only 154 monthly Patreon contributors listed on the Patreon website. 
Contrast that to the over 20,000 followers that Tri- Twiv has on Facebook. I am sure that other listeners will be su- as surprised as I am at these numbers. I had put off contributing out of laziness and now wish I had done it sooner. I'll end by thanking you for finally recording a plant virus episode. <coughs> In the mid-1990s, I worked at a now-defunct company that tested grapevines for economically devastating viruses and saw similarities to the citrus virus problem talked about in TWIV 503. I do not believe that many people realize the impact that microbes have on our food and beverage industry or the efforts of the many creative people working not only in labs, but in the field who are trying to find a way around the problems. I wasn't aware of the citrus problem and can again thank TWIV for raising my awareness, as you have done on many other occasions about a wide range of issues over the past few years. Perhaps someday you will host an episode on grapevine viruses, as I am sure that many of your listeners enjoy a good glass of fermented grapes. (laughs) Cheers, Barbara, (laughs) who is from San Diego, where it's 85 degrees and sunny. As Um, usual. (laughs) <laughs> yes, and I am now incredibly worried about grapevine viruses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, w- when we were in Texas A and M, I spoke to a faculty who works on grapevine viruses, mm-hmm. and so one day we'll have him on. He does very cool things, but of course, Dixon, the solution is to put all this indoors, right? I would. Well, that's well, you can. It's a good start. Could yes. you put uh, grapevines indoors? Sure, absolutely. You can vertical wine. Why not? Yes. <laughs> I have a vertical tasting. <laughs> you know what that is? No. It's a successive years of a, of a given uh, mm. type of wine. And those are very, very uh, telling because it shows you that your palate can distinguish between the years. Nice. And it's a, mm. it's a lot of fun, too. You've done this. I, I have many times. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, I want to thank Barbara for pointing this out, this 154 and 20,000. So please help us out. There are a lot of you out there that listen. Um, you could help us. It doesn't take much. You could do a buck a month. It's less than buck a latte. A month. That's not even the cream that goes into your latte. Come on, that's. Just, <laughs> I agree. So that's, you know, if you have t- half of those twenty thousand gave us a buck a month, that'd be great. We'd be able to hire people and travel more. That's right. Do more for you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Mm-hmm. D- Dixon, can you take Larry's? I would be happy to. Larry writes, "Greetings, Twivovar." I'm writing from Syracuse, New York, on a perfectly mild 72 degrees Fahrenheit Sunday afternoon. I just listened to TUIV 496 while doing yard work, and I was alarmed by the story about the physician who claimed that there was no scientific evidence for herd immunity. However, maybe this shouldn't be such a surprise. I don't know how much epidemiology is covered in medical training, but I can tell you that a fair number of introductory microbiology textbooks for undergraduates cover herd immunity minimally or not at all. In the episode, Vincent asked about evidence supporting herd immunity, and over the course of the discussion, some examples were given. I tell my students that in the 1990s, diphtheria epidemic in the former Soviet Union is among the most powerful examples of an inadvertent experiment testing the hypothesis that vaccination against childhood diseases is no longer necessary. As the Soviet Union broke apart and vaccination of children declined, the number of diphtheria cases exploded. From 1,436 in 1990 to 50,412 in 1995, the peak year. In total, more than 140,000 cases and 4,000 deaths were reported, with a large proportion of cases in adults. Control of the epidemic ultimately required widespread immunization of both children and adults. While there were a variety of contributing factors, population movement, socioeconomic instability, deterioration of health system, the large proportion of susceptible adults and children was key. I'm slowly catching up on back episodes. Probably this story has been described already in the Pixoverse, but I think that as educators, we need to be proactive in emphasizing the importance of herd immunity, especially for students entering health-related fields. Thanks for all you do to keep the TWIVs running. As a faculty member of a community college, I enjoy wonderful day, daily interactions with an incredibly diverse group of students, but I sometimes miss the research talks and journal clubs of my former life. Twix is helping to fill that hole, and I'm encouraging my colleagues and students to tune in to keep up the good work. Best wishes, Larry. He's uh, up in New York State, up near uh, New York, uh, Syracuse, in Onondaga Community College. Cool. Yeah, it's a good example. Indeed. It turns out that the, the uh, herd immunity doesn't work is one of the 
typical anti-vax claims. Yes. In fact, well, if we get to it today, there's a website where that's one of the claims. Herd immunity has never been shown to work. <sighs> you know, just lies, lies, and videotape. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Uh-huh. I'm increasingly frustrated with a world that doesn't value truth. Value truth any That's longer. Right. I don't right. get it. Or uses alternate truths, as they call it. Right. Which is even worse. This isn't exactly herd immunity, but the last time I had someone tell me that herd immunity didn't work, I asked them where Zika went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did did they right. have an answer for you? <laughs> That's right. They, they didn't. They never really thought about it, and yeah. that that. At it's, least got us into a conversation of population uh, immunity. Brianna, it's playing hide and Zika. <laughs> <laughs> Next one is from Bang, who writes, Hi, Twiv Docs. This may be of interest to those decided against the use of vaccines without medical reasons. <laughs> We'd like to offer a Malaysian folk treatment for mumps infection and, quote, who knows, N-O-S-E, if it will work in humans. I guess I should narrow it down to the Chinese community in Penang, Malaysia. In Penang, an island in northern Peninsular Malaysia, the majority Hokkien Chinese community calls mumps infections skin on pig head. And he gives a uh, a Chinese writing of that. And you can appreciate how all the swollen facial lymph nodes make one look rather like a pig head. My uncles had so much fun scaring me about how the testicles will swell and I will be sterilized. I was so afraid that I was constantly checking up on my manhood, even though I had no idea and why that was important <laughs> at my very young age. This method was in use before washing machine was affordable to most. Why would that be important? One of the vital ingredients is hard to come by after washing machine became affordable and hand washing was no longer practiced. The treatment requires three ingredients, namely Chinese calligraphy ink, a bluing dye used in whitening clothes. To this day, all Malaysian primary and secondary school uniforms still consist of a white shirt. Most of us in my age range have suffered from rocking up to school on a more blue than white school uniform. And a person born in the year of the tiger, 1962, 74, 86, <laughs> etc., in 12 years cycle. The tiger person is to prepare blue ink using the bluing dye and paint it on the side of the face that is swollen. And when it is dry, then write the Chinese character for tiger using calligraphy ink in a specific way that will that the last stroke will entrap the tiger and the pig in a circle, allowing the tiger to, I assume, devour the pig. See attached photo. Mm. And he sends a lovely drawing done with blue uh, ink and calligraphy mm. of a tiger. It's cool. Uh, I must add that my parents took me to the doctor before my grandmother insisted on this folk treatment. It was unfortunate that I was the only tiger in my family while I was suffering from mumps infection. And the only other tiger person was a childhood friend living next to my maternal grandmother's house. My uncles and aunts all didn't like that particular neighbor, so my youngest uncle carried me out, carried out the above treatment for me. Talk about folk treatment done incorrectly and how a person's tribe's pride can get in the way of a cure. Thanks for the great podcast. P.S. I'm the one with a daughter in Perth, Western Australia, who thought that Vincent will personally deliver the prize <laughs> to CD4 Hunter Contest winter. So all right. the checkings did pay off. <laughs> what a great story. That's funny. Yes. I love it. It is funny. And I love this drawing. I think it's so pretty. It's it good. Is. It is. It's very it good. Is. So the background is the blue dye, and then he wrote with the, the black calligraphy. Right, with the black calligraphy ink, the character for tiger, tiger. and a circle around circle it. Circle around it, yeah. On the on the cheek of the pig face person. Yep. Yes. Right. Alan, you're next. Sure. David writes, Dear Doctors, Doc Dye and Doc Tay. Okay. <laughs> I just listened to Twiv uh 496, and it was great to hear an open, down-to-earth, and humble debate about vaccines. One thing was missing for me, though. The role of the state, legislation, schools, religious groups, and the pharmaceutical industry was discussed, but the health sector was barely touched upon, or the scientific community for that matter. And still, from what I understand, it is not mandatory for U.S. hospital staff to be vaccinated. Some doctors even declare a child to be allergic to eggs in order to do away with vaccine regulations. How can that be? Doctors are supposed to be believers to take scientific evidence into account to try to save lives, right? I can understand that people who went through personal tragedies or who are just gullible or who are looking for a world not entirely made up of Monsanto veggies are misled and join the anti-vaxxers. But doctors should know better, I believe, and the only reason I can think of why they would undermine their nation's health is personal and mostly financial gain. My question is, therefore, is the medical sector not itself at least partly responsible for the negative aura surrounding vaccines? 
perhaps I completely misunderstand this, but I would say that a doctor who casts doubt about herd immunity should lose their license, and this could be enforced by the order of medical practitioners. A nurse who is not vaccinated should not be allowed to work in a public hospital at all, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that by giving free reign to a few rotten apples, the medical sector itself makes way for confusion and epidemics. Maybe it's my lack of knowledge about the U.S. perception of personal freedom. I am from a European descent myself, and it's often hard to grasp how there can be a debate about, for example, gun control in your country. Maybe there are good reasons not to bring up yet another factor in a struggle that is already complex, but it's somehow worrying that they don't even come up in the discussion. Greetings from a rainy 26 degree C Chinotepe, Nicaragua, where we have our own share of turmoil nowadays, uh, awesome. David. And um, uh, P.S. After having listened to Twix since 2013, I have come to the conclusion that MDs are more like engineers than like scientists. <laughs> Contrary to my original conception of the profession, they are not necessarily seekers of absolute truth, but rather seem to pragmatically use what science brings them to muddle through and provide the best care to their patients, whether motivated by personal gain or, vo or vocation to make this world a better place. I highly respect most of them, intelligent, hardworking people who save lives on a daily basis. I just feel bad about those straying against better knowledge. And David, I think you, um, uh, you, you nailed some important points here. Um, so yes, there are, there are inevitably in any profession, there will be a few people who don't, um, don't really get what they're supposed to be doing. And um, there are doctors who, of course, uh, are accorded a great deal of prestige in our society. Um, a few of them have come out against vaccines. And because doctors are considered prestigious and knowledgeable, this gets a lot of hype among the anti-vaxxers. Um, look, this doctor is endorsing our views when, in fact, this doctor is just somebody who uh, who's taken the similar uh, similar nonsense on. Um, there are, in fact, some hospitals and health networks that do mandate vaccination. And this is becoming uh, more and more widespread. This is something that's been discussed at immunization meetings that I've been to. Um, they do it in various ways. Some places will have a policy where um, you must be if you work there you must be vaccinated uh and if you're not you have to wear a um a respirator mask throughout flu season for example yeah here here that's the case yeah that's and that's very commonly done the point of the respirator mask is twofold first of all to protect patients from these staff members who could be carrying influenza uh and secondly to uh not let these people off the hook mm -hmm. so right. you know you want to skip the vaccine? Okay, you do have the personal ability to do that, but you're going to have to wear this mask around for six months out of the year. Um, the scarlet letter. Yes. So that's that's not only stigmatizing, but also if you've ever worn a respirator mask for an extended period of time, you know, it's very, very annoying. Um, so, yes, this is something that that does come up in the overall debate. I think you're right that it's not emphasized uh, a whole lot, although perhaps it should be. Um, and, and I think your characterization of MDs is spot on. They, uh, they are, they are people who generally respect truth, but generally they're looking to science for specific solutions to specific problems. And I think I've related on a few occasions that I have conversations with my wife where we, we just reach an impasse because she says, no, that's, <laughs> that's not the way we do this. I agree. I think um, I, we've talked on this, touched on this before, that I don't understand why any physician could speak out or question immunization. You would think that, and we talked about that on 496, that uh, medical exemptions are a huge problem. The, one of the participants said they should be about 1%, which would be normal medical conditions, but they're around 10%. And that's right. too high. It is. And I, I just think we must, we need to examine what is taught medical students in their curriculum about vaccination. And I think it needs to be emphasized that uh, they have to do better. And if they have questions, let's bring them up now. What, what's your questions about vaccines? Why do you have an issue? Because everyone going out there needs to be full on. Because as Alan said, they're the one, they're the point of uh, giving vaccines. And right. You know, uh, it's just a very, fr and we have a letter coming later from a physician in, in the same, maybe a physician, I don't know. Uh, Dixon, <laughs> can you take the next one, please? I can. Alex writes, greetings, dear Twiveracy. I'm frying at 30 degrees C 
86F here in Berlin while listening to your podcast. Just that moment, I heard your discussion about postdoc depression during their first year. Desperation. Okay, desperation, <laughs> during the, that, which translates to depression. Um, this uh, remembered me, reminded me of an essay I once read, The Importance of Stupidity in Scientific Research, by M.A. Schwartz in 2008, Journal of Cell Science, uh, volume 121. Um, failing and feeling stupid is not only normal, but part of the very principle of science. In the end, one always researches something he does not know about yet. So science is born in curiosity and obligately requires stupidity. Is that really the quote? I regularly experience periods of time when I think I am simply bad in science, but ultimately even accomplishing nothing in the lab generates the knowledge that is at least that that at least is not working as one thought. Hence, regardless of the outcomes in science, everyone's a winner. Keep up your curious and passionate attitudes. Best wishes, Alex. Remember the book by uh, Stuart Firestein, Ignorance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. It drives science. <laughs> didn't he do a follow-up on stupidity? I think it was or failure. Failure. Failure, that was it, not failure. stupidity. Yes. The difference between ignorance and stupidity, right? Stupidity is mean you'll never think your way out of a paper bag. Ignorance means you just never heard of it up to that well, point. Well, you know, you know what clearly <laughs> separates ignorance from stupidity, right? You're going to tell us. <laughs> the, the Potomac River. <laughs> That's good. I like it. It's an old Maryland show. I like it. I like uh, it. Uh, Edmund writes, hi, I listened to your podcast. You have inspired me to study science when I was 35. I am now 36 and a half. <laughs> Not very far in science, still really old. You know. Who am I half of? Uh, that would be 72. Probably half three. of me. <laughs> Who's 73 years old? I'm older than that. It has been a great inspiration so far. I should also mention I've been modeling my speaking voice on Mr. Dr. Rich Condit, <laughs> if my guess is right, and I have gotten surprising comments on it so far. Anyway, I'm in Atlanta now, up from Pensacola, to see the Bodies exhibit, and I want to reach out. You're for further inspiration to me and thanksgiving to you, all of you, you're absolutely wonderful. Being from Pensacola, I have a listener pick podcast-wise. You probably already know about STEM Talk from IHMC. That is the Institute of Human and Machine Cognition. Very cool interviews. And I have to take this opportunity to thank them for all the monthly lectures they begin bring in to speak. Outstanding and twiv-worthy, if I do say so myself. Check out Greg Smith, if memory serves, Northwestern University. Took over my mind for a little while. I still can't stand how little I know. Thank you, all of you folks and people <laughs> and anyone else for all that you do. So Greg Smith has been on TWIV, herpes viruses, and I have a link to these IHMC STEM talks. Cool. Let's do a couple more. Brianne. Sure. Um, Raymond writes, Dear Professor Racaniello, in a recent TWIV episode, there was a reference to the anti-vaccine controversy that was initiated by the bogus claims of Andrew Wakefield. I think there might have been a few references. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there is a program entitled Seriously on BBC Radio 4, which, details with, which deals with serious or interesting topics. One episode entitled In the Wake of Wakefield might be of interest to the TWIV team and or TWIV listeners. Um, the link for the program is, and then he gives the link. The program can also be downloaded for listening at a later date. In closing, please keep up the good work of the TWI podcasts. Sincerely yours, Raymond, uh, who is from Northern Ireland. And he says, it's a beautiful summer evening here at approximately 2040 hours with a temperature of 13 Celsius. <sighs> Lovely. Indeed. Alan. Anthony writes, Jersey girl. Woman was bitten by a rabid fox, so she strangled it with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is... Uh, While cell phoning her friends with the other... <laughs> this is in honor of our, yes, T Tammy Dubois, <laughs> Pitts Grove Township news article. <laughs> and apparently she was out um, outside and a, and a rabid fox bit her, and so she grabbed it and killed it. Go Tammy. And then they tested they, it was positive. They tested right? it, and I gather it was positive for rabies. So. so she's being immunized. So they say in this article that if a fox, fox are typically nocturnal, so if they come up to you in the day, yes. they're probably not well. Yeah. Exactly right. Yes. 
Uh, uh, should I do another one? Is yeah, do another one, sure. Okay. Uh, Heverton writes, Dear Twiv Squad, I've been a fan of the show since I've heard about it on episode 388, where I had the honor to have my paper, Wolbachia Blocks, currently circulating Zika virus isolates, um, commented on by you guys. As a matter mm. of fact, that paper cost us $5,000 to be published as an open access article. I would guess that's right, $5,000. An absurd amount of money. We only managed to have it as an open access because the Gates Foundation, which funded the research, promptly gave us the money to do so. I think paywalls are absurd, and I'm totally in favor of the preprint movement open access journals. That being said, I wanted to hear your opinions on the idea that I've been thinking of lately. What if journals that charge us fees for publications developed a point system for reviewers where, after reaching a certain amount of points obtained by reviewing papers for these journals, the reviewers would then get discounts and even free-of-charge publication bonuses for a paper they submit to the journal? This would increase the incentives for us reviewers to keep reviewing papers for these journals, something that we currently do absolutely for free and would also provide a beneficial beneficial system to the journal itself that would keep getting reviews from now motivated reviewers scientists anyway just an idea keep being awesome and heverton's a postdoc at boston university and i think heverton you put your uh, thumb on the problem when you said um something that we currently do absolutely for free and as long as that is the case for peer reviewers the journals have zero motivation to implement this uh, mm. what i think is a brilliant system that you just outlined um but if the uh, if the peer reviewers were to choke that off and insist on something like this collectively, uh, then I think that could be done. But we will not all decide not to review papers. Of course not. Together, because you're right? scientists and you won't all do anything together. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is the way we are. I have to say, many years ago, I was involved in an effort to start a journal with a few people here in the area. It was going to be an open access online journal. And one of our ideas was that if you reviewed, that would go towards your page charges, right? Right. And we had a dinner one day. We got together with some potential funders. They brought us to, um, what's that fancy place downtown with big open glass areas? Four Seasons. Four Seasons for lunch. <laughs> and that, at lunch was announced PLOS was being founded. Oh, wow. By Harold oh. Varmus and Mike Eisen and Pat Brown. And that was the end of that. They said, it's done. Sorry. Gee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we need ended. another one, though. We need another one. <laughs> it all ended there. But you could use more than one. Yeah, it's a good Goodness. idea. Goodness. Let me take this last one. Tim writes, as a retired MD, I have enjoyed a variety of podcasts on wellness. Thanks for your continued discussions. In episode 496, that's our vaccine episode, you asked how individuals can continue to talk against vaccination. I just heard a source and would like to hear your discussion. I hope I can forward it in this email. And Tim is a retired family practice MD. And he sends a link, which I will not allow anyone to follow. I'm going to put a no follow on this. And if this is what he's worried about, it's called the Comprehensive Critique of Vaccines, and it starts by saying vaccines have not been demonstrated to be effective. All the old tropes. And even if they <laughs> confer short-term protection, it's at the cost of long-term deleterious consequences uh, to the immune system. The toxins unnaturally introduced cause Too many too soon. Heart, Do we get that in there? Too many too soon. The average child receives yeah. 69 yeah, immunization yeah, yeah, yeah. and herd immunity does not exist. work. Yeah, all the standard talking points, all of which are completely preempted by vast quantities of literature. This is all wrong. It's all uh, been proven. I mean, but, we you know, do in, clinical in trials, right? Yeah, <laughs> in, in Tim's defense, I mean, a, a retired family practice MD, I'm guessing this is somebody who practiced you know, some time ago, mm -hmm. and family practice is a very, very practical aspect of medicine. Um and very, very much, you know, people come to you with their day-to-day -day problems and you figure them out and you come up with the best solutions that you can at the time and getting back to that discussion of doctors as engineers. Um, and, you know, this is not somebody who's going to do a whole lot of thinking about vaccines except as pediatrically um, and probably hasn't done a whole lot of thinking about them since medical school. Um so if you came across this type of video being presented persuasively by another MD, uh, maybe you'd maybe you'd wonder. Um, but 
Tim, you don't need to wonder. This is uh, this is just nonsense. It's the same thing that the anti-vaxxers are always trumpeting about, and they are they are completely unmoored from the facts. Um, see previous episodes of TWIV, and this is uh, this is well established in the peer-reviewed literature that uh, the this whole line of discussion is just nonsense. Vaccines have been shown to be effective. Yes, they've been. That is yes. a requirement for for FDA marketing of all, except a very, very few vaccines that you did not receive because they're they're in there by special exemption. Uh, you know, like the biodefense vaccines. But other than that, everything, all the vaccines that are on the market, even the ones that came out 50 years ago, went through clinical trials. They've been shown effective. They've been um, studied probably more thoroughly than any other pharmaceutical product. I mean, every statement made in the summary of this podcast is just factually incorrect. Yeah. Well, listen to this. Yeah. How are vaccine manufacturers shielded from liability for va- from vaccine injuries? They're not, they're not shielded. No. <laughs> they're not. They there's have, a special court. <laughs> there's, yes. Well, the reason there's a special court is because nobody would manufacture vaccines if there wasn't. Correct. What's so wrong they, with- need a, they need a predictable legal process for dealing with this, mm-hmm. and there is one, and that's what was legislated into existence with the vaccine court, which, by the way, does dole out compensation to people who are proven to have been injured by a vaccine. And that does happen, and we've, we've pointed this out on the show. There are, uh, you know, the, vaccines are not zero risk. The ones that are routinely given tend to be exceedingly low risk and certainly lower risk than the diseases that they're preventing. But there are side effects and there are things that can happen. And uh, probably the most notable recent example is oral polio vaccine, um, which could occasionally cause polio. And if that happened to you, if you were one of the one in several million people who developed poliomyelitis from the vaccine, then you go to this vaccine court, you demonstrate that that's the case with you know, reasonable testimony by doctors. Um, and you are then, you know, supported. And obviously this is a very unfortunate outcome for those people, but they are compensated for that injury. And then longer term, the solution to that is that we have phased out the use of that, that vaccine. What's wrong with the science that denies a connection between vaccines and autism? There's nothing wrong with the science. In fact, go listen to 496. One of the panelists gave this story of a community, an island community somewhere yes. that uses measles vaccine, has never had a case of autism. No connection whatsoever. So I don't understand. What is the or motivation? Or measles, by the way. <laughs> what is the what right. is the motivation of these individuals to perpetuate yeah, that? And and on that panel, they they concluded it's financial because they're selling other things. It's that, sponsored, yeah. It's sponsored. it is it is certainly if you trace it back to Wakefield, which a lot of this should be, that was blatantly financial, as was exceedingly well documented by Brian Deere. Mm-hmm. Freedom of information right. requests. Right. I mean, this this was all a huge scam to um, to fleece ma- vaccine manufacturers, and that's why that paper was was fabricated and published, and it was done explicitly with that agenda. Yeah, and Tim, I would also suggest you listen to Twiv Five Hundred, where we had um, sure. Gin- Ginny Sue from Immunized Texas, who talked a lot about the problems. Is this this is very troubling, more so because in the past few years we are now in a culture where lying is accepted and facts are yes. no longer appreciated. And I'm scared for the well being of humanity under these mm-hmm. conditions. I really am. And vaccines I think are the tip of the pro- of the iceberg. It's symptomatic of all the other issues. You see yeah. you know, you're absolutely right, Benson, and, and you look at the popular press well, maybe not press, but you know, like Google and Facebook and Twitter and all those. I'm other sad areas. to say they are now the popular press. Yes, they are. <laughs> and, but they're starting to push back also for these quacks that get on there and just go off. This guy that has a big radio show, Alan, you must remember this guy's name. He just got fired basically from all popular media as a result. Did He's a conspiracy about, theorist. You're talking about InfoWars, Alex Jones? Yeah, that's Jones. the one. Yes. Alex Jones. And, well, and they played a little excerpt. I'd never heard this guy before. He's horrible. And he screams and he, oh, yeah. what is, what is wrong with him? He's got a psychiatric diagnosis, I think. 
I don't I don't know what's going on with him, but he's definitely got some issues. He's like Crazy Eddie. Remember Crazy Eddie? The, the advertisement for Crazy Eddie, the uh, electronics genius that got caught with his hand in everyone else's till <laughs> and is now doing you know, like you know, 30 you consecutive know that, um, years of jail or something. Here's the thing. People immediately scream First Amendment, but you know what? These are private companies. Yes. They, you do not have any right to be That's on right. them. It's this is exactly so right. widely misunderstood. <laughs> That's on, right. Especially yeah. on the internet. The First well, Amendment That's means right. that That's the correct. government that is, is not allowed to prevent you from saying things right. except right. under very narrowly circumscribed situations. And the government is not allowed to punish you for what you say yeah. except, again, under very narrowly circumscribed uh, situations. It says absolutely nothing about what, you know, what nonsense needs to be spewed through what private channels Correct. that is yeah. entirely up yeah. to those private channels. Yeah. They had a lawyer exactly. on the other night on PBS uh, news and uh, she was from the university of Virginia and she described exactly uh, the delineation of that law about freedom of speech. And, and these companies have a right to kick anybody off basically. Yeah, yes, yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I just feel very powerless that we have all these issues this is our stuff vaccines right yeah, and right. Mm -hmm. we you know we reach a certain fraction of the people we reach are already converted. preaching to the converted <laughs> I, don't, I just right. wish we we and other scientists could reach more people because this is just oh. unacceptable you see science that's that's the key here because i think there's there's an innate mistrust of science that that permeates modern culture and yet how could that be with all the conveniences that they're taking advantage of to complain through? All of it depends on science. How could you possibly be against science when everything else in your life is dependent upon scientific discovery? There's a huge contradiction there, yes. Don't get it. I don't get that at all. You know, I'm tempted to say, okay, you don't believe in science. Uh, give me back your car. Give me back your house. Give me back your clothes. Just take the stuff that doesn't require technology and you've got it. Right. And then, you know, they'll look at you like you're crazy. What do you I mean? Always, oh, I like I, that I, science. I don't like this science. Yeah. No, no, it's all the same. Sorry. I always feel a little bit better at the end of the semester when students mention uh, that they're planning to go, you know, get vaccines they had missed uh, <laughs> or that I've, they've made, I've made a little difference every year. I think maybe, you know, those five students or so who I've convinced. Do you think, uh, Brianne, that stu some students come in with anti-vax views? Oh, oh, yes. I've had students come in and t uh, tell me about their anti-vax views. Um, at the beginning of the semester. Hmm. Uh, well, well, let's do something. By the end of the uh, semester, they at least know not to tell you that. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly generally, right. I did have uh, one famous example of a student very earnestly asking a pretty anti-vax question um, where the students um, were practically ready to uh, take out their phones and videotape my answer. Because uh, <laughs> I wasn't entirely calm, but. Ah. Generally, <laughs> sort of lost it is what you're trying yeah. to say. <laughs> yeah. It's right. easy to do it. Let's, let's do some easy. picks. Yeah. Brian, what do you have for us? All right. Um, I have um, one of many uh, news reports of something that came out a week or two ago. Um, as people probably know, there have been a lot of um, searches for things like uh, water other places, particularly on Mars. And there was a discovery of an underground lake um, on Mars um, that is the first liquid water that has been found. Um, and so that certainly changes our ideas about um, what types of uh, life theoretically could be there um, and things like that. Um, as I said, it's underground, um, so it's not yet something that could be um, accessed particularly well, but it seems to have some similarities to um, underground water sources in Greenland and, and, and Antarctica. Um, and I thought it was really exciting when I heard yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's directly the, under the South Pole, as I recall. Yes. Hmm. The ice fishing probably sucks, but it's uh, <laughs> definitely, probably. definitely neat news. And, and the way they found it was really cool with this, uh, I mean, detected... They, they've got orbiting ice penetrating radar yeah. that's mm -hmm. probing the whole planet and that, that this showed up on it. I think technologically that's just amazing. Yep. Yeah, I think it's really fantastic. And I, you know, really impressed with sort of the level of detail um, uh, that they had about, you know, thinking about temperature and salinity. Um, yeah. 
from, course, from radar. <laughs> yeah. This doesn't mean that there was life. No, uh, no. of course not. Of no. course not. But a lot of people interpret it that way. But, you know, unfortunately, Mars is bombarded with ionizing radiation, which got rid of all the water. You know, it, it and the atmosphere, it. too. Don't and, <laughs> and there wasn't oxygen being produced to keep it there. That's, right. so that's the thing on Earth is that we had photosynthesis happening, which kept um, – the breakdown products of water from leaving the atmosphere. This is right? True. right, right, So right. the Mars is only one sixth the size of the Earth. Yeah. So the molten <laughs> center of Mars actually solidified, and that shut off the magneto, mm -hmm. which kept the solar wind from blowing away their atmosphere. Right. And the moment that happened, Mars became a, an inert. If it was Earth before, it was inert. The inert. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. right. Um, but I know that uh, everyone has enjoyed talking about the Martian. Um, yeah. This could certainly <laughs> yeah, that's right. cause some changes in what might happen with the Martian. Well, we could actually live there if the water was potable. Right. Exactly. You can go, Dixon. Okay. Alan, what do you have? I have um, just a press release that uh, was a long, long time coming. <laughs> Ebola research has started at the needle in Boston. Wow. Hey, and this press release mentions some people we know. Um, talks about uh, the long process of getting this BSL four facility up and running, and I guess the construction was done in two thousand eight, and we went and toured it when it was not uh, hot, obviously, because we got to go into the areas that are now closed off to everybody except the certified folks who are doing the work there. And now, ten years later. They are finally working on Ebola and Marburg viruses, and of course, just in time, because these are very much in the news. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the link to Needle in this first paragraph, you will see in the upper right, yes, Condit, Rack and Yellow, and Dove in full BSL-4 suits. Yeah, I, yep. missed, I missed that. I, and, I'm really uh, sorry I wasn't you can, there. You can find our video, <laughs> which was just so much fun to do, and it's an hour video, and it's great. Yeah. It's still great. Pretty never, fun to watch. As Alan said, never done before, never will be done again. No, I, I blew it. It's very cool. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> congratulations, finally. Yeah. Dixon, what do you have for us? I have just a general heads up. I ran across some images and followed them back to their sources, and they all seem to come from a science photo library source. And I wasn't aware of the fact that there is a science photo library, um, although I should be because it's a, it's a fairly old service. But if you go to the website and just click on Google search, uh, Google images rather, you will get an array of quite beautiful, stunning illustrations and photographs and all kinds of other illustrated materials that uh, the photo, the science photo library can provide for you. You have to and buy them though if you, you want. You do, to. yeah, they're for sale. This is true, but they're not that expensive if you've got a budget of a certain level. Of course. They have a very interesting uh, mechanism of preventing you from downloading them. <laughs> they're, they're, each one is divided into uh, segments, and which if you if you mouse over them, it uh, becomes green. And then you try downloading, exactly, you can't do exactly. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you get low image resolution if you yeah. use a screenshot. So, yeah, well, I, I, it's fine <laughs> to support. You know, if you need yeah. to to do that, it's fine. But if, if you remember, uh, Brianne's had a, had a cool pick a couple of weeks ago about some some clip art that you could use yeah, for I free. Render. Exactly, yeah, that's, that's very exactly. cool. But these are. Very nice. Yes. Yep. Well, and if you're working on a on a textbook or a sure. professionally produced website, th yep. then paying for stuff is usually not a problem. And it looks like these prices are pre pretty reasonable, just from the few that I yeah, clicked. exactly. Which I thought too. That's what I thought. Nice. Anyway, very interesting. More visuals. Yes. Very good. Uh, my pick is a article from this past Sunday Times. When I I get, oh, yeah. I get the weekend delivered, I I looked at the magazine and it was a black cover with a single line of white type across the surface, and it said, 30 years ago, we could have saved the planet. And this is a single article in the entire Sunday magazine by a single author with photographs by a single photographer. Uh, and it's called Losing Earth, the Decade. We almost stopped climate change. Almost nothing stood in the way except ourselves. Nathaniel Rich, photos by George Steinmetz. And it's pretty moving. It starts with yeah. the very beginning. It is moving. It is. And the scientists who, who said, hey, there's a greenhouse effect and tried to convince people to do something. And we almost had an agreement. And almost did. now we don't. And the article says now it's really too late to do anything. 
Um, it's pretty well, sobering. It's not, it's not too late to do anything, but it is certainly a lot harder and going to be a lot less optimal in the solution than it would have been if this had been done in the 80s. Yeah. And, you know, right. it goes through in the very beginning, you know, if one degree is going to do this, two degrees and four degrees, you know, billions of people will die. It's very sober. And you know what? Nobody Tough. believed it because they just didn't believe it. It just didn't sound possible. Well, well you know, it, it was partly that it didn't sound possible, but also because it was very clearly going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> well, yeah, involve, that too. Involve a lot of people's it's true. You know, cattle getting slaughtered, so to speak. Yeah. There's one yeah. point in the article where he's talking to a politician and who's, who apparently doesn't believe in it, and he says, no, no. I believe it. It's just there's no solution, so it's politically not believable. Right. <laughs> right. Anyway, if you have the stomach, you can get to it and read it. It's pretty sobering. Yep. All right, that's TWIB 506. A little bit sobering episode today. We had a lot of vaccine issues and environmental stuff, but that's the truth of the world we're living in. Sure. But, but we also had a town- spectral biology paper. Yes. And a town in Australia hasn't had a dengue case in yes. four years. That's very cool. That's a great, great accomplishment. I hope it mm-hmm. spreads to other We're places. We're just ending on a dark note, that's all. <laughs> TWIV 506 Apple Podcast, microbe.tv slash TWIV. As you know, if you listen to podcasts on your phone or tablet, there are apps that you use, and you can search for TWIV in those apps. Please subscribe. It really helps us to, to get lots of subscribers. And, of course, if... Uh, you want to support us financially, as was mentioned before, only 150 some people are doing that. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You could see the different ways uh, that you can do that. And please send us your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. Dixon de Palmier can be found at thelivingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Brian Barker is over at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Rackenyello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral.